This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sages, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research that I am conducting at uh, Petty Bridge uh, Evade Lab with Sarah. And I've been working on this project a little over a year, and it is exploring the genetics of Cercospora baticola towards management of uh, Cercospora leaf spot of table beet in New York. Yeah, so table beet industry in New York is uh, second in production uh, behind Wisconsin. So it is really important uh, vegetable industry here. And uh, the table beet industry is mainly for uh, a fresh vegetable or processing and packaging. Um, however, the, the table beet is, is prone to uh, many fungal and bacterial diseases. Uh, such as uh, Cercospora baticola, damping off due to Rhizoctonia and Pythium, uh, leaf spot due to Foma, and uh, bacterial leaf spot Pseudomonas syringae. However, my main focus today will be on Cercospora leaf spot caused by uh, Cercospora baticola. And it is an important foliar pathogen. Uh, it causes Cercospora leaf spot, as I already mentioned. Uh, Cercosporas are mostly hemibiotroph. Uh, that is, they have a biotrophic life cycle and then they switch to necrotrophic uh, phase. Uh, the complete resistance mechanism in table beet is not known, although there is some uh, research in sugar beet where there are resistant cultivars which are uh, kind of uh, tolerant to the pathogen. Now, Cercospora baticola in New York is primarily controlled with, with fungicides, and that is the most uh, important aspect of this uh, research is a uh, lot of pathogens and not just Cercospora baticola are now you know, developing fungicide resistance, especially to the single uh, site mode of action. So it's, it's time to think about you know, how we can alternatively manage the Cercospora baticola. And uh, I think the genetics of this pathogen will provide uh, important uh, clues on, on this aspect. So here uh, on, the, on my screen, you can see uh, the arrow pointing. This is a field that's, that's hammered with, with Cercospora leaf spot. And it's because the farmer missed uh, just spraying uh, one time. And uh, uh, below you can see a field that doesn't have any symptoms, it's green. And on the right, you can see the typical lesions caused by uh, Cercospora baticola. Now the main, main loss or the main uh, cause of loss is is defoliation by this pathogen. And uh, beet is primarily harvested by pulling the beet plants by holding on to the leaves. So if there is defoliation, the machine cannot hold on to the leaves to harvest the beet. And so that significantly causes yield reduction. A um, lot of research before I came into Sarah's lab was uh, focused on population biology and uh, sexual mode of reproduction. And a lot of you may know or Nilofar, she did a lot of work on the population biology, uh, sexual mode, and then that, that research was kind of carried on by Noel, who looked at uh, the, the uh, potential uh, sources of uh, uh, inoculums, such as weed species, uh, like uh, dockweed, lambs quarters, uh, wide mustard. Um, and this is uh, where I come in, uh, is uh, trying to, you know, move this research forward, is looking at a different aspect, is uh, trying to dissect the genetics of virulence and uh, cercosporin production in cercospora baticola, because, because there is a whole lot of, lot of information that we still don't have on the genetics of the uh, pathogen. So I have two main objectives on my research is to first to get insight into the infection biology of Cercospora baticola. And for that, I'm deploying a fluorescent microscopy with a GFP strain, which is part of, part of the, the uh, genetic screen that I'm doing. And my second big objective was to identify genes regulating virulence and Cercosporin production. And for that, I'm deploying a forward genetic screen currently. And for that, I am using an isolate uh, TB14085, which is associated with Cercospora leaf spot of uh, table beet in New York. And uh, it has already been sequenced and the genome is assembled and it was uh, done by Nilofar in 2018. Uh, before I go into my uh, project, uh, 
I want to discuss a little bit about why I'm also looking at sarcosporin. So sarcosporin is, is thought to be an important virulence factor in several sarcosporin species. And uh, what we know about sarcosporin is, is that it's, it's, it's synthesized by this cluster of genes. It's called the sarcosporin synthesis, uh, biosynthesis cluster. And initially this cluster contained eight genes, uh, CTB1 through eight. And it's, it's like a polyketide uh, synthase pathway is, is, is the main pathway that's required for the synthesis. Um, uh, and there are other enzymes, of course, you know, transferase and oxidoreductase that are involved in, in the synthesis of this, this uh, phytotoxin. Um, however, recently there was research in Cercospora baticola from a group at NDSU and they found out there, there were four additional genes involved in synthesis of uh, sarcosporin and they named it CTB9 through 12. So this is, this is an ongoing work. And sarcospora is known to be produced by all sarcospora species. However, it is not the only secondary metabolite produced. There are others. Uh, we know some, we don't know many. It's a non-host specific toxin, that is it is, uh, produced by Cercospora species infecting corn, soybean, beet, um, all crops. And it is photoactivated. So on the right, uh, you can see the figure where light is required for uh, induction and production of Cercospora, which produces uh, superoxide radicals. And these superoxide radicals is what causes disruption to the plant cell membrane, uh, thereby you know, causing damage. And this causes the cellular contents to leak to the intracellular membrane. And this is utilized by the fungus um, as a source of nutrition. Now, initially, when I started this project, I was interested in looking at, you know, sarcosmine production in my isolate. And sarcosmine production is, is very easy to phenotype. So on the, uh, on the left, you can see it's, it's PDA and it's in constant dark. Uh, PDA is, is actually acidic medium. And when you grow Cercospora zeomatis, it's, it's a pathogen of corn, in constant light, it produces this very bright red pigmentation. And that is due to uh, production of Cercospora. But when I started making uh, my proposal and I wanted to look at Cercospora, I had this oh crap moment in my isolate because I saw that my isolate was not producing sarcosporin. And my initial thought was that, oh my God, maybe I'm doing something wrong. You know, it has to produce. Um, I kept trying and I was not successful. So I initially beshelled the idea, you know, um, all right, you know, if it's not producing sarcosporin, I'm not going to look at this phenotype. I'll focus mainly on uh, pathogenicity. So, so my, uh, my methodology was, was pretty simple for doing this forward genetic screen was uh, I used agrobacterium mediated transformation of Cercospora baticola isolate uh, TB1485. Uh, and so this, this plasmid was, was uh, PBHD2 SGFP was put in agrobacterium AGL1, which is used in transformation of a lot of uh, other uh, filamentous fungi such as Pomopsis, Fusarium um, and others. And so the method methodology is, is pretty simple. So you induce sporulation in your, in your pathosystem and you mix with the agrobacterium fumifacient strain AGL1 harboring the plasmid. And then you, you, go into, uh, you mix them in one is to one volume ratio and you co-culture them in a medium that is required for induction of agrobacterium. And then you transfer, transfer these, uh, this to uh, you know, using cellophane membrane to a selection um, medium, which contains uh, hygromycin because the, the plasmid harbors a hygromycin phosphotransferase, which gives the uh, bacterium the ability or the positive transformants to uh, the ability to grow on plates uh, having uh, hygromycin. However, I also deployed uh, a reporter, uh, GFP, uh, to uh, select my mutants because these mutants can then also be utilized for fluorescent microscopy. Uh, so uh, I used colonies that were not only growing on hygromycin, but also were fluorescing GFP, which you can see uh, from the plate on the right, you have 
these different colonies having different levels of uh, GFP production. And once I selected the mutants, um, I uh, did an inoculation assay in the mist chamber. So I, I was dealing with large number of mutants and initially I thought, you know, uh, doing point inoculation would, would give me an easy, uh, easy measure of whether the pathogen was, was virulent or avirulent. Although this, this method is, was, was really dirty, but this is how genetic screens go, is you're dealing with a big population and you want to do something really quick. So this was mainly uh, looking at uh, whether they were virulent or avirulent, or whether, you know, whether they're less virulent or not. And as you can see in this picture at the center, some of the mutants were actually producing symptoms after 14 days of inoculation in, um, in mist chamber, and some of the mutants were uh, not. So I wanted to select a mutant for microscopy, and um, I did like a, a spray uh, method to look, at, uh, uh, to look at virulence. And so this is, this is a picture from um, one of the trial. And uh, I selected one of the mutant or one of the strain to look at the infection biology. And my main interest was to look at spore germination, stomatal tropism, aprosorium formation, and in all look at the infection process. So I sprayed uh, the spores onto the leaf surface and then I incubated them in the mist chamber. And uh, on day one, I was able to uh, find uh, the spore uh, on the leaf surface. And by day two, the spore had started to germinate. Uh, and by day three, I was able to look at this, this complex hyphal network, you know, growing all over the leaf surface. And one interesting aspect, what I found from this study was uh, circonspora beticola. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the conidia is actually um, multi-celled or multi-nucleate. And each cell had the ability to, you know, produce hyphae because in a in lot of fungal species, Either just one uh, one side of uh, sorry one side of the spore will germinate uh, in some both the sides, but in Circonspora beticola, all all the cells were able to germinate. And by day four, I was able to look at the infection process. So as you can see with the arrow and the red arrow pointing, the the fungus is is beginning to penetrate the stomata. And that is the only way how that fungus is able to infect the plant cells. And not just infect the stomata, but it appears like the fungal is forming, forming uh, some like uh, aprosorium like structure. Uh, although I'm trying to look, look at this more closely and it's, it's, it's still an ongoing uh, process. I'm also trying to optimize how to better take uh, pictures with beet uh, because the leaves are really thick. So I had the infection biology and um, in my genetic screen, I was able to uh, generate and screen about 1169 mutants for their ability to cause disease. And in my whole process, uh, majority of the strains were virulent, which is as expected, 98.2%. However, uh, 21 of my uh, mutants were either avirulent, like seven, or had reduced virulence, uh, so 14 strains. Um, I'm doing, so these were all based on, you know, point inoculations, and right now I'm performing like a replicated uh, mesh chamber trial to make sure that this, this phenotype holds, and we'll get a more clearer picture when I, uh, when I complete the, the project. Now, not only uh, looking at avirulence, but some of these, these mutants were also exhibiting a range of phenotypes, especially on V8 medium, such as, so on the center, you can see the wild type isolate, and on, the, on surrounding the wild type isolate, you can see a range of phenotypes uh, displayed by these uh, mutant strains. And uh, as you can see, this, this lower, this is my favorite strain, and uh, it appears like something is really, uh, screwed up with this because the growth growth is really slow and it's also one of the mutant that's avirulent on, on table beat. Uh, so this was the second oh crap moment I had in my research uh, because remember I was showing you my isolate was not able to produce circosporin and I kept thinking that I was doing something wrong but during my process I found out that a lot of these mutant strains were actually overproducing or rather, you know, producing circosporin uh, and not just in light, 
in PDA, but also in dark. And at this moment, this has raised a lot of questions. Like I'm now thinking where, what am I going to do? So uh, hopefully we'll have, we'll have more answers. Uh, and not just in PDA, uh, this, uh, the phenotype was also holding on clarified V8, uh, where, where some of the mutants that were overproducing on PDA are also showing similar phenotype on uh, CV8. So the main thing about, um, about forward genetic screen is trying to identify where the mutation was. And, and it's a big bottleneck right now. Uh, but however, we are kind of developing this uh, target enrichment uh, sequencing strategy to identify the site of mutations. And I had kind of developed this protocol during my PhD uh, studies, but I had deployed ion torrent sequencing uh, met, uh, you know, uh, uh, platform. We are trying to optimize this, this using Illumina. It's, it's like exome sequencing. However, the, the uh, use of target enrichment in, in fungal genetics is, is very limited. And a big advantage of using this target enrichment sequencing is it's high throughput. Uh, we can sequence multiple samples simultaneously. You don't need information of the whole genome. And a big advantage is, is we can identify single and multiple insertions uh, from, from one run. Um, I wish I could talk more about this, but uh, since we are out of time and um, if, if you're interested in discussing or you know, more, we can of course do, do this later. So to, uh, to conclude my uh, talk, the GFP label strain is providing insight into the infection process of Cercospora baticola. Uh, I don't see any stomatal tropism, which has been um, shown in a lot of other Cercospora species. Uh, we do see, however, formation of acrosoria. Uh, we don't know what the role of this acrosorium right now is. Uh, it'll, it'll uh, of course, you know, it's, it's an ongoing project. And a forward genetic screen is, is identified 24 mutants of interest where 14 are reduced virulence. And we also have mutants with increased circospline production. And then, you know, target enrichment sequencing will be utilized to identify the site of uh, mutation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Sarah uh, for giving me this opportunity to work on this project uh, and Evade Lab, Sarah and Frank and, uh, Daniel, uh, sorry, I didn't mention uh, his, his name in here. And of course, the technical staff uh, for, for, um, for support during, during this project. Um, and if I have time, I will happily take questions. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.